Thanks for that. Thank you very much, Ware. It's great to be here at Town Hall. Um, <clears throat> amidst so many friends and, and relatives as well, um, I really am happy to be in Seattle. So on a clear, on a clear morning in May 1865, Adele Field landed in the British colony of Hong Kong after a 149-day voyage on a tea ship from New York. A friend had squeezed Field still suffering from a fever into her wedding gown. And there she was, waiting unsteadily on board the ship for her fiancé, a Baptist missionary by the name of Cyrus Chilcott, out of New York. The pair had met and agreed and gotten engaged and agreed to meet again in Hong Kong, where they'd planned to get married and then move off, move off to Bangkok to preach to Chinese migrants there. So a rowboat approaches the ship, but Chilcott's not on board the rowboat. The boatman tells Field that, I'm sorry, but your fiancé is dead. He died of typhoid fever several months earlier, while Field herself was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and unavailable at the time. The captain of the ship then tells Field, well, you should come back with me to New York. But Field decides to go to Bangkok by herself. A farmer's daughter, born in 1839 in upstate New York, Field grew up at a time when the great social and feminist issues of the 19th century were really rousing a generation. Women in the North had fought against slavery, and at the end of the Civil War, they demanded opportunities. Women's colleges opened, and by the time Field herself was 25, she was the principal of a girls' school in New York. Following her fiancé's death, Field was hired as a, as a missionary by the Baptists, becoming one of the first single women to be a missionary in Asia. Because of Field and pioneers like her, the American missionary experience, or it's the endeavor in Asia and in China, became a profoundly feminine one. Women, especially single women, would soon make up the largest share of American missionaries in Asia. So after clashing with a very conservative Baptist minister, who unsuccessfully had Field tried for blasphemy, because she had a predilection for dancing with the occasional single men. She also liked to play cards. He didn't know that she also actually liked that occasional bowl of hashish, but that's another story. She leaves Bangkok and she moves to the, the Baptist, a Baptist mission in Shanto on the southern coast of China. It's known to many people as Swatow, where she, where she joined the Baptist mission. And within a year, Field opens a school called the Path of Brightness which constituted the first formal literacy program for, for women in modern Chinese history. She called her, women, she called her students Bible women. <clears throat> she soon expanded her curriculum to include hygiene, childcare, basic medical skills, and geography, so that her missionary work pretty much very quickly left the evangelical side of the ledger and moved into sort of looking like an early version of the Peace Corps. Returning on vacation in the 1870s and 1880s, she was an enormous hit in churches around the country where she would go and speak about her China experiences. She authored a bestseller on the habits of Chinese women, and then she became also on another furlough, one of the first women to take a medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania's medical school. But over time, her heart was kind of moving on. Uh, Charles Dar the principles of Charles Darwin and the principles of modern science really began to trump Buddhist doctrine, uh, to a Baptist doctrine in her heart. And she also concluded that America, in the end, needed her more than China did. So in 1889, after about 20 years of missionary work in China, she left the Baptist mission. And she became a nationally renowned scientific researcher in the United States, a world specialist on ants, uh, a leading proponent of the theory of evolution, much to the shock and dismay of her former Baptist colleagues, and a leading suffragette as well. And um, in some sort of interesting circular way, she died actually in Seattle in 1916. To field and other pioneers like her, China and the opportunity to go to China gave them a certain freedom and opportunity at a time when American women could get an education but they had very limited job opportunities in the United States. So for single, American, uh, for single American women especially, being a missionary was actually a fantastic job 
Uh, it, huge amounts of challenges, an enormous amount of responsibility, hardship for sure, but they could really be their own woman outside of the bounds of family and the construct of living in the United States. In China, women American missionaries could be surgeons, when in America, they were almost banned from operating rooms. In China, women American missionaries were the deans of departments and universities, when in the United States, they had really just begun teaching at the college level. And so these women set in motion what would be a pattern whereby American women would find freedom and a chance in China, far from their homes in the United States. And you can flash forward to 1995, and you can ask yourself the question, where did Hillary Clinton regain her political momentum after the first tough, tough years as First Lady in the White House? It was in 1995 in Beijing at the UN International Women's Conference where her argument that women's rights are human rights inspired a generation of Chinese women, but also women around the world. Like Clinton, Field and her American sisters had a really big influence on, on, the Chi on Chinese women that has generally gone unchronicled in both the United States and in China. <clears throat> they were key to, I think, the single greatest human rights advance in China's modern history, which is the unbinding of women's feet. And they also campaigned strenuously against the, the practice of female infanticide. American female missionaries put baskets by the sides of Chinese lakes with notes, place your babies here, do not throw them into the pond. American missionaries also took the lead in educating Chinese girls and providing them with role models for a new type of life. But it's interesting because single American women missionaries occupied this interesting space. They had come to China to help Chinese women become Christian, find a nice Chinese Christian husband, and settle into a life of sort of Christian domesticity. But many Chinese women looked at the single American women and did what they did and not what they taught. And so you have the first graduating class of Jinling Women's University, which was a US-funded university in Nanjing. They took a vow not to marry. And in fact, everyone but one of them kept that vow until the day she died. Now, of course, women from other countries vied for influence in China. So there are anarchists from Russia, there are revolutionaries from France, but none could match the American women in their numbers and in defining what it meant to be a new woman on the cusp of a new century in China. So Adele Field's story is an example of the often unchronicled influence that Americans have had on China and vice versa. And it's but one of scores of, of these tales that make up my book, The Beautiful Country in the Middle Kingdom, America and China from 1776 to the present. When people ask me what my book is about, I say it's, it's about three things. First of all, it's really a story, a tale full of swashbuckling adventures, grifters, soldiers of fortune, merchants, plotting diplomats, students, laborers, revolutionaries, and zealous converts who together make up this story of the interaction between two great countries, one that considered itself the apex of the West and the other that considered itself the apex of the East. And it's about patterns of a love-hate relationship that has risen to this kind of rapturous enchantment and has crashed to the depths of crushing disappointment with great regularity. And it's also about, as we've seen in the case of Adele Fields, this deep but often unacknowledged impact that each people has had on the other. And one of the arguments I make in the book is, is that the US-China relationship sometimes seems kind of stuck in this Buddhist cycle of reincarnation with enchantment, following disappointment with the, the turn of history's wheel. And there are lots of echoes in our history. And so take, for example, the fight against the female infanticide. So as you know, as I just said, with the Dell Fields in the 1800s, it manifests itself with these baskets by the sides of waterways, also with the opening of orphanages. But in the 1990s, it returned to the United States with this huge trend of adopted Chinese girl babies from 1991 Till today, American families have adopted 80,000 babies from China, and almost all of them are girls. You, you see that in the late 19th century, you had white Americans along this coast, from California through the Oregon Territory into this, into this fine land, who took a massive action, often violent, against Chinese labor. They railed against the Chinese taking white men's jobs. Doesn't that sound a little familiar? You had some Americans at the time also maintaining 
that if we were patient with China, if America supported China's reforms, that it would transform itself over time into a nation very much like the United States. A very similar argument to what was made in America in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, that if America was benevolent to China, it would become like a, a democracy. You also had people at the same time back then saying that this type of hope was a mere hallucination. And that's very similar to the type of stuff you can hear today as well. So the contradictory way in which we approach China, sort of threat, opportunity, we're fearful, we're benevolent, are really hardwired, I think, in our DNA. And in that way, Donald Trump, our president-elect, is definitely no outlier. So on the campaign trail, right, you, in his accusations that China was, to use his words, raping the United States over trade, you could hear the, 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 the shouts of the California Workingmen's Party, which rose to prominence in the 1880s on a platform that attacked both California's elites, but also Chinese migrants. Trump's let's make a deal bravado, his belief in cutting a grand bargain, you can hear in that also echoes from the 19th century. Just today, Trump broke with decades of, of American precedent when he spoke directly to the president of Taiwan. The first, it's the first time that a president or a president-elect has, has spoken to a Taiwanese leader since 1979 when Jimmy Carter broke relations with, with Taiwan and established relations with the People's Republic of China. And in that way, Trump also represents a strain of American thought which has viewed our embrace or our close relations with the People's Republic of China as a mistake and has longed for more support for Taiwan. So if Americans are conflicted in how we deal with China, and we're definitely conflicted, the Chinese are also conflicted in how they deal with us. And again, the echoes come from the past. In the 1870s, about the time that Adele Field was going to China, the Qing Imperial Court embraced a very controversial policy to send young boys, I mean very young boys, eight, nine, ten years old, to the United States to study. And the boys were sent initially to Hartford under the care of, in Connecticut, under the care, care of a Yale University graduate by the name of Young Wing. There they boarded with American families, learned English, and excelled at sports and at school. And the idea proposed by Young Wing and embraced by Chinese reformers at the time was that these boys and hundreds of others of like them would bring back to China the secrets of Western technology and military science to help the Qing fight the imperialists, it be they the, the British, the French, the Germans, or ultimately the Japanese. But from the start, the Chinese educational mission, as it was called, ran into trouble. So the Qing court sent minders along with the boys to ensure that they kept on studying the Confucian classics. And when these boys began shedding their Confucian robes, and donning jackets and ties, the minders said, you know, you can't do this. And when the boys tried to shave off the, their cues, their pigtails, the minders threatened to send them back. And then when several of the boys began to attend church with their host families, the, the minders threatened to shut the program down, and ultimately the program was shut down after several years. In 1881, the New York Times editorialized about the closing of the program, and, uh, stating that China cannot borrow our learning, our science, our material forms of industry without importing with them the virus of political rebellion. Well, you flash forward to today and we see the Chinese Communist Party struggling with the same issues. How to use Western technology to modernize its country without importing the virus of political rebellion. And so, to do it, the China, China is again moving to block American influence. In 2015, China's education minister called for a ban on all textbooks promoting Western values at all of China's schools. The government has called for artists and architects to serve socialism, which means to oppose America. China's clamped, clamped down on video streaming sites that carry lots of American content, and it's even reordered uh, the renaming of housing developments that carry pro-Western names, like Yosemite or Golden Manhattan Dream Village. So, <laughs> Like Confucian officials of yesteryear, the Chinese Communist Party also is instead trying to inculcate the young Chinese with its own ideological values, which these days are this kind of very uh, nasty form of nationalism, which basically say that China has been humiliated for, for, many, for many centuries by, by the West. And like the Confucian minders of yesteryear, President Xi Jinping also wants to include Chinese students, including the 250,000 Chinese students in America, in what he calls this patriotic energy. But somehow, 
like this a bad gene in China's DNA. The China's the pro-American proclivities of many Chinese still torment the Communist Party, which sort of explains why it's so paranoid about American influence there. So the focus on the patterns uh, of our past is, is one of the, the main themes of the book. But The Beautiful Country is also an attempt to, to, myth, to bust some myths, if you will, or to construct a new scaffolding of, of understanding of our common story, a story that, that's too often either politicized or just basically ignored. So for sure, American missionaries were guilty of cultural imperialism, as lots of scholars have suggested attempting sort of to shove this love of Jesus down the craw of an unwilling China. But at the same time, they also brought Western medicine, science, and education to China. And that really did improve the lives of many, many Chinese. Also, from the communist side, it's Communist Party doctrine that the United States is out to contain China. But I also show in the book that no other country has been really more important to China's rise than the United States your, my open wallets, our open society and open universities have really helped propel China's rise. And the Chinese could usually, they would be good if they were reminded of that every so often. Another thing I try to accomplish in the book is to bridge a gap between the story of Chinese in America and the story of America in China. Because the success of Chinese in America has had a huge effect in creating a very positive image of the United States in the minds of many Chinese. And the story of the Chinese in America is full of a lot of, surpri of surprises. We all know, of course, that Chinese laborers built half of the Transcontinental Railroad. But few of us know, uh, less of us, fewer of us know, that actually Chinese capital funneled through Boston investment banks was a really important part of investing in the Industrial Revolution in the United States. And in fact, the first time that the Chinese were involved in any railroad projects in America, it was through the family of the, 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 the ancestors of our Secretary of State, John Forbes Carey, uh, an investment bank called J.M. Forbes, based in Boston, uh, which invested in the railroads, invested Chinese capital in the railroads. Uh, he, uh, John, uh, John Forbes himself, made his millions in Canton, came back to Boston, started his company, and brought back with him much silver from his Chinese partners, which went in building some of the first railroads that went from the East Coast to Chicago. So that's one of these uh, you know, historical uh, fun facts that, 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 that goes throughout the book. We know, for example, that the Chinese in the United States were subject to a raft of racist ordinances and laws that for even banned all Chinese laborers from the United States. But few of us know that the Chinese actually were involved in thousands of court cases that challenged these laws across the United States and that Supreme Court decisions in the 1880s and the 1890s laid the judicial basis for the dismantling of the separate but equal school system for African-American children in the 1950s. In addition, the Supreme Court case, and Donald Trump needs to be reminded of this, confirming citizenship on someone born in the United States was brought by a Chinese. So the surprises keep coming. At the present day, many Chinese have a troubled relationship with the identity politics of the left. Many oppose affirmative action, even though many benefited from affirmative action. And a group of mostly Chinese families has taken Harvard University to court, for example, alleging that Harvard and other leading American institutions actually have a higher set of standards for Asian applicants than they do for others. Many first-generation Chinese also voted for Donald Trump, swayed by his tough guy authoritarian vibe and also his attacks on political correctness. Like I said, it is a deeply tangled story and a relationship. So I was asked in Washington, who's this book for? And really, I think it's for anyone who's interested in the most consequential relationship between any two countries in the world. It's for people who like big histories, and I don't know if you've seen it, it's kind of a big history. It's, a little, it's lethal at a low altitude. But, but it's also for people who do business and academics and policymakers, but mostly, actually, I wrote it for the general reader because China is a part of our lives. It's going to become more and more a part of our life. It's the biggest uh, uh, carbon uh, emitter. It has the, probably the second most powerful, if not the third most powerful uh, military in the world. It, is a it takes up, a it of course, the most populous nation and the second biggest economy, and it's only going to keep on getting bigger. Friends have asked me why I devoted six years of my life 
to the project. And my first response was that only is some, someone as knuckleheaded as a recovering reporter could pick something to do like this to do. But secondly, my personal history really drove me to the project. I, I first went to China in 1980, part of the second group of Americans to study in China since we normalized relations. I became a reporter, and in 1989, I was expelled from China uh, during the Tiananmen Square crackdown for stealing state secrets and violating martial law provisions. I then re returned to China. I got back in with the Washington Post in the mid-1990s, and I had this front row seat as China emerged from this third world backwater to become the second, most, uh, the second biggest economy in the world. I met the woman with whom I would marry in China. We had our first, first child there, and over the past four decades, I've lived there for about almost 20 years. And so in these ways, I, I'm a product of this and a beneficiary of this interaction between the beautiful country, which is what the Chinese call America, Meiguo, and the Middle Kingdom, which is what China calls itself, Zhongguo. Uh, so and that brings me to the third part of the book, which is an attempt to kind of show a way forward, especially during these perilous times, suggesting that if the Chinese would learn a little bit more about us, and if actually we would learn a little bit more from them, we could perhaps uh, nudge the relationship onto a little bit more of a stable ground. Um, so I forgot where it said I was going to speak for uh, 40 minutes. I'm actually only going to speak for like 20 some odd minutes because I really would actually more be interested in your questions than in babbling on forever about the book. Um, so with that, I'm going to end and I want to open it to questions and hope we can have a, a, a nice discussion tonight. Thank you very much. <laughs> And the mics, there are mics, one here? Yeah, there's mics on each side. Uh, if you have a question, we have a good amount of time for questions. So just line up at one of these mics and just remember to keep your one question in the form of a question. Thank you. Um, so uh, my nephew's wife is, lives, they live in San Francisco and they're bringing in, she, her, she's Chinese. Hmm. Um, and she's bringing high school students in. She sponsors them. So we say they, and I just wonder, what is the, what are the Chinese families now sending their high school children to the United States? I mean, you, you kind of said that earlier. They spent young kids over. But, I mean, Chinese are so stable now, and they have a good economy. And what is the payoff for the parents who are sending their kids, their, your young children, the high school over here to the United States? So, um, we, just like we look at Chinese education now and think, wow, they're so good at math, we got to get some of that. They look at us and think, you're really creative and innovative, we got to get some of that too. And so there's a mutual kind of appreciation society that's going on between our society and their society over education. And coming to the United States as a high schooler, and that's actually, it's the growth area. First it was grad school. Then it was college. There's a lot of college students here now, and there, a lot of them are paying full freight, and it's not scholarships. And now, as, as you've just pointed out, high school, the number of high school students from China and the United States is just booming. And it's people want to get over here earlier because they think that up to, up to about eighth grade, the Chinese system is wonderful because it teaches, gives kids a very strong foundation. But once they move into high school, high school in China is hell. Because basically, you have to spend all your time studying for a three-day examination that's going to be given to you at the end of your junior year. Or actually, in some cases, the end of the senior year. It's called the Gaokao. And it's a three days of hell. And based on your score on those three days, your path is basically determined what school you can get into. And the amount of memorization that you have to do in high school is ridiculous. And many Chinese families make the calculation that they don't want their sons and daughters to go through that hellish period, and that they want their sons and daughters to have access to an American university. And if they do high school here, the chance that they can get into a really good Mar American university is actually much higher than if they stay in China. And so that's, what, that's why the kids are coming over here earlier. And it's the belief also that if they get into American high schools, and, you, and you're, you, you're, you're your uh, uh, daughter-in-law, your I don't, she must know all the good American uh, areas where there are good high schools. Like, for example, in my neighborhood when we used to live in Bethesda, we lived in a really good catchment area for a great public high school. Within the spaces of four years that we lived there, in, in, uh, from 20, 2009 to actually 2007 to 2011, eight Chinese families moved in within walking distance of us because they wanted their sons and daughters to go to that public school. 
And of course, that, and then Andover, Exeter, they're flooded with applications from Chinese looking to get into the US school system. Yeah, huge market. And there's a lot of like skullduggery and cheating that goes on in China to get into that market, but that's <laughs> the nature of the business. I was wondering if you could comment on the sort of change in political ideology in China over the past, uh, I don't know, 20 years or so from a relatively, what appears from the West, from perspective here, you know, very rigid communist system to much more liberalization and economically and how the general public uh, perceives that kind of thing. So the Chinese economic system has changed vastly from the, the days when I first went there in 1980 until today. It's, it's a much more open system, uh, but it's still a system that is controlled politically by the Communist Party. And so while the Communist Party has basically shed all of its egalitarian principles, it has not shed its belief that it alone should be the, the, termin, the, one, the one thing that, that determines Chinese fate. And so in terms of political freedoms, it's, it's, in some ways, it's, it's worse than it was in the late 1980s. Uh, and the space for discussion and debate is a lot narrower. But that said, the space for being an agent of one's own fate, for being successful, for getting rich, for going overseas to study, for having, you know, going, you know, going on, uh, to wonderful places on vacation is much broader also. So it, it's, it's very interesting that political freedom really has not advanced uh, but that said, uh, economic freedom has advanced, it's changed extraordinarily. And right now, if you look at China's economy, pretty much every five years, the percentage of what's state-run in the economy shrinks another 10 percentage points. And so now we're down to about 30%, about 70% of the economy is now, right now in private hands. But the people who are running that economy, who own that economy, are not enemies of the Communist Party. In fact, most of them are Communist Party members, and many of them actually have official positions in the Chinese government. So it's, it's now become almost this sort of party state and a party economy as well. Um, so it's, a, it's a, an interesting hybrid of a very authoritarian society and a society with a lot of, of, of freedom economically. Being familiar as you are with both cultures, we in America see our problems, especially recently, in a certain way. From your viewpoint, if you could look from China, how do you see the problems of the United States? So um, it's for excuse me. It's pretty interesting. Um, I went to college in China in the early uh, '80s, and the, some of my classmates left and moved to the United States in the late 80s and you know, lived here and, and uh, did nicely. They're sort of solid middle class people. And for many years, they were looked up to by many of my college classmates. Uh, and then starting in like the late 90s, as my college classmates who stayed in China started to make a lot of money, uh, mostly in the real estate markets, um, they would take trips to America. And the, the, the new line was, well, those folks uh, moved to America, but boy, their house is small. You know, they only have one car. They don't have a big screen TV as big as this curtain. You know, they just have a normal size one. And, and as China became more uh, richer and richer, they began to sort of look down on the people whom they once thought were wonderful for ag actually having made it out and, and moved to America. Um, Another thing that the Chinese talk about is when the first Chinese returned to America in the, in the 1970s and 80s after we normalized, the Chinese wrote about the United States. They, they, they enthused about the lights of the United States. They, they, they said that we're a culture that is on a bicycle and Americans are in a car. There was a Chinese poet who took a plane from coast to coast and she wrote a whole poem describing the lights that she saw below her. Because in China, one, she'd never been in a plane, but two, China was dark, basically from her perspective. And nowadays, the Chinese, when they come back from the States, say, God, America is so slow. I mean, we're fast. You know, look, we, we wanted to build a high-speed rail. The Americans have been talking about it for years. We did it, you know, in six months. It's there. Um, and so that's, that's changed as well from their view of us, that we, we can't get things done. We, we, we respect property too much. We have too many human rights. It gets in the way of development. So that's one line. 
But on another aspect, there is still a continued respect for the United States because they believe that we're a nation of values. And the Chinese look at themselves now, and given their cutthroat economy, given the intense competition there, they are, if, if, if you could say, they're sort of envious of the fact that we, they believe that we have a belief system. So that's another aspect to it as well. Can you give some examples of what China does better than the United States that you would love to see us import when so, those products are... So I think that China is potentially posed to be... Um, for its own reasons of self-interest, not because they're nice people, but, but in a position to be, posed, to, to, be, to be the leaders in clean technology and low carbon economy. And they're putting an enormous amount of money in that. Um, uh, an example would be electric cars. Um, they're gonna be the biggest battery producer in the world and they had a great deal of trouble and they still can't do, they still can't make a drivetrain for like a basic automobile. But electric vehicles don't have a drivetrain. They just have batteries, and they've, they've gotten around that problem because they don't have to do it, and they're focusing a huge amount of resources in electric vehicles, and that's an area which is gonna be a lot better for the world. And they, they can do it, and the Chinese cars are just a lot simpler. Chinese engineering is interesting. It's, they're, they're different from the Japanese in a way. The Japanese engineered to very, very high standards, and when global standards were met, they were set, they were always set below Japanese standards. And so Japanese products often couldn't compete, like, for example, ATM technology. The Japanese had the best, but Cisco and other people beat them because they were good enough. Well, the Chinese technologies right now, they basically come in at the good enough level. And as Chinese consumers demand that they increase the technology, the technology increases, and at that point, it's good enough for the whole world. And specifically in clean tech, I think that there is an error. And especially if on the climate change front, we kind of backtrack on this, the Chinese are going to be poised to be able to be in a very, very good position to, 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 to rule that part of the economy. So. Oh, thanks. Okay. Um, I hear a lot in the news about how China is you know, crack, getting more anti-Western yeah. and cracking down on this and that. And I know some people who are, uh, left the United States and left Europe to become entrepreneurs and open businesses in China. And they all seem to be doing really well. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to them, they say that they really haven't run into much in the way of problems. They're also really friendly people, and maybe that's all that they know how to work the system. <laughs> but any comments on how American businesses going into China don't seem to be having problems despite all this anti-Western feeling? So if an American business is a big, is a big business, um, like, for example, Apple has a lot of problems in China right now. Um, Boeing doesn't have too many problems, but if we have bad relations with China, Boeing's going to have a lot of problems. Um, so, so if you're a smaller entrepreneur, smaller foreign entrepreneur in China, um, you, you, can, you can skate under the radar pretty, pretty easily. But that said, that the anti-Western political crackdowns that are happening, and they're happening, and it's, a, it's pretty much as bad as it was right after Tiananmen Square in China, um, they're not targeting individual foreigners, per se, but they are targeting foreign influence. And so foreigners can have business. But that said, the environment now, compared to what it was, let's say, five years ago, is also a lot worse, even for foreign entrepreneurs. Uh, we, lived, we just moved from Beijing in August, and we have friends who are in the restaurant business who got rousted out, kicked out of China, basically. Um, the, the Chinese partner saw that the opportunity was perfect to steal, basically steal the restaurant from, from this Spanish guy uh, because of this, this anti-foreign push. They've changed their visa laws, making it more difficult for foreign entrepreneurs to come to work to China. Now foreigners are rated according to your education, your age, and a variety of other things. And if, you're, if you don't really make the grade, then you have to leave. So it's, 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 it, it's, it's actually bleeding into the, to the community of foreign entrepreneurs. So they'll get their chance probably, sadly enough. Um, from what I've uh, been reading about China over the last five, or five years or more, I've, I've been waiting for it to collapse mm. um, economically. And I, right. I, can, I can mention an example. That there was a 60 Minutes episode where th there weren't merely ghost villages like we saw in Spain and Ireland after the 2008 global yeah. collapse. They, they have, they have mid-rise cities that right. are completely abandoned. How do they, how, how can China continue to be viable when they do things like this? Right. So that's a, that's a great question, and it cuts to the whole issue of this massive debt 
that they have. They have public-private debt at about, about 250% of GDP, and it's growing. They grow their economy these days because it's slowing down by, by just throwing a lot of state money at infrastructure projects still, even though they understand that that's not sustainable. There is a fungibility to it, though, that allows it to go on. And that's because it's not a commercial, these loans aren't commercially based. You have a state-owned enterprise, a bank, lending to a state-owned enterprise, and in, you know, a, a coal mine. And uh, no one's calling in their chits, because the government says you can't call in the chits. And so it gives it a sort of a s certain sustainability up to a certain point. If they do not begin to do significant stand on enterprise reform, allow these zombie companies to begin to fall, you know, to begin to go out of business, then they're going to have real trouble. But whether that's going to be two years, three years, five years, eight years, it's anybody's guess. But it, it's not a commercial relationship, sort of, you know, it's not like our housing crisis where guys in Florida stopped paying their mortgages and then the thing began to unravel. Um, this is a different type of system, and as a result, and they have a lot of cash, and so it's, it's, it, they have a longer bit of a, a, bit of a window. But, but if they don't do the reforms that they need to do, that they've said they were going to do, but they haven't started doing yet, they will have, they will probably have to have a come to Jesus moment, or a come to Mark's moment. So, yeah. So Seattle has the uh, distinction of having the, the first Chinese American governor elected in the United States, in the history of the United States. And also the first Chinese ambassador. Yeah. yeah. And he actually grew up about five blocks from here for six years of his life in a public housing pro project. I wonder if you could comment on both the interesting elements of him coming to China right. and him leaving China. Okay. Um, so Gary Locke. Um, what was has you know has had quite a, a quite a quite a life, and um, he was fascinating when he came to China, um, both for uh, how the Chinese perceived him, but also for how the U.S. government was somewhat afraid of him in a weird way. Um, when he came to China, as he was coming to China, uh, he went to, through SeaTac Airport, and he stood in line uh, for star at Starbucks, and he bought a Starbucks. He had a backpack over his back, and his little daughter Madeline, his the youngest one, was next to him. And a Chinese traveler snapped a picture of Gary Locke buying a Starbucks by himself, and he put that picture up on a Chinese social media site, and it went viral. I mean, it was just insane. And the the point about the picture was. This is a senior American official, and he's buying his own coffee. How come our senior officials are all corrupt idiots waiting in the blue room for a, for a, for a Chinese like mistress to give, give them their tea? And it was done, and, and from the moment he got there, the Chinese, many Chinese, sort of the more independent media, were entranced by him because he had a nice family and you know, he took walks through Beijing, and he seemed like a normal guy, and he didn't stand on, you know, he didn't think he was, like, you know, really totally above everybody. And so the Chinese were always comparing him, get back to this issue that the Chinese think American have values, they were comparing this, you know, very American but Chinese person, comparing them negatively to all the, the corruption and the sleaze in the Chinese government. And so the Chinese government didn't like that. And when he left, they attacked him. They basically called him a banana, um, <laughs> things like that. I mean, saying, you know, he's not really Chinese, you know, he's an idiot. Um, and uh, their, some of their state-run media wrote a series of essays against him that were very similar to the essays that Chairman Mao wrote uh, uh, in the 1940s about the departing Americans, where he made all these negative comments about the United States sort of as a parallel. Now, uh, on the U.S. side, the American government was reluctant to use the, the, this star power that both uh, Gary Locke had and his wife had, his wife's also a Chinese American, to sort of show the, the best qualities of, of US and US values. Because the United States government is, has always been reluctant about engaging in that discussion with China. We talk about, sort of, we hectored China about human rights but we're much more reluctant about sort of showing our, our values as, as sort of citizens and as a, and as, as a family culture than, 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 than we are about basically saying you shouldn't put X, Y, and Z in jail. I thought that was, and he was hamstrung a lot, and she wasn't basically even allowed to work whatsoever uh, while she was in China. Uh, you have mentioned Apple. When we look at products, we see American corporate logos 
and we have to look in the small print at the bottom of the back and we see made in China. Right. Can you talk about the role of Western corporations in the growth of the industrial output of China? Yeah, um, it, it has been absolutely um, essential to China's exports. Uh, and the Western corporations, both from the US and from Europe, have been, uh, been key to China's rise. And there's, uh, in terms of electronic goods, um, there's about 50% of the electronic goods exported from China come out with a Western logo stamped on them. And when we talk about things like our trade imbalance with China, when an Apple of iPhone comes to the United States, it's logged as a $700 plus dollars of American trade deficit to China. But the reality is actually in terms of value added in China, it's only about $20. Um, most of the value work is done in the United States and then it's assembled in China, uh, including things like the chips, et cetera. So um, it, it's, it's a much more, so even when you get into trade statistics, it's a much more complicated relationship than it seems on paper. But that said, you're, to your point that American corporations and other uh, uh, Japanese and, and European corporations have been essential to China, the creation of China as the factory of the world. Now the Chinese themselves are now going into these, these businesses. So the biggest uh, camera lens um, manufacturer in the world in term for, for iPhones is now a Chinese company. And the, the best uh, windshield um, manufacturer is a Chinese company. And so they're moving up the food chain, um, but in many ways because of what they've learned from the American and, and European and Japanese corporations that have based themselves in China since the 1980s. Um, I just came from Hong Kong, and there have been a number of pro-independence demonstrations yeah. in the last few months. And I think Taiwan is also probably watching what happens in Hong Kong. Um, and China clearly stepped into the Hong Kong judicial system and said, Hong Kong, you're never going to be independent. Yeah. Give up this idea. Yeah. But I think Hong Kong is looking to the Western world to protect it um, because the Western world values democracy more. And you also said the president-elect has just spoken directly with the Taiwanese president. Yeah. Um, do you think the U.S. will get involved, and why or why not? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't really know the answer because, well, one of the reasons is because I don't know the future, but also just because Trump is so unpredictable. You just can't tell what he's going to do. Um, and you don't know whether, I mean, this phone call to, to Tsai Ing-wen that the, 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 the questioner referred to, the Taiwanese president, is an extraordinary break in precedent. And we've never done anything like this since 1979. And it's really going to piss the Chinese off. And the question is, did he do it knowing that this was going to happen? Or was just like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> Tsai Ing-wen's on the line. You want to talk? And he has advisors who were very pro-Taiwanese, pro um, which is fine. But, but this, this is, if you're going to do something like this, and there's an argument for doing something like this, you have to think it out, and, and, and just by looking at the, the readout that the president-elect's office issued on this, it's like, you know, we talked to this guy and this guy, and by the way, he talked to Tsai Ing-wen too. Um, and, and so it's like, it, it's unclear. Um, the question about Taiwan, um, about Hong Kong, the Chinese have um, pushed the Hong, uh, the Hong Kong people um, very far. Um, and the Hong Kong people are pushing back. And the independence movement, although very small in Hong Kong, is kind of a creation of the pressure that Beijing has put on Hong Kong because it won't agree to uh, a more democratic type of system that they had actually initially agreed to a while back. And uh, how Hong Kong plays out, of course, is going to have ramifications for how Taiwan plays out. But it's clear now in Hong Kong there's an increasing divide, and the Hong Kong people uh, used to look down on the Chinese, um, but now they really don't like the Chinese. Uh, and the Chinese have a lot more money. And there's, um, uh, a, a, I, I don't know how that, that, that situation could have played out, but it's not going in a very positive direction. And that's had a knock-on effect on Taiwan, because if you look at um, public opinion polls in Taiwan, and t Communist China claims Taiwan as its province, and of course Taiwan doesn't believe that. But public opinion polls in Taiwan basically say maybe 2% at most of the country wants any type of unification with China, whereas 30 some odd years ago, it was probably 25%. And so there's no love lost in Taiwan for the people of, of mainland China. So this side and then you, or is it your turn? 
This may be a little beyond the scope of your book. Nonetheless, what is America's, the United States' influence and intentions in Africa relative to those, compared to those of the Chinese? Inter so, interest in activities so in Africa. The, the Chinese have spent um, a lot of effort in Africa um, on resource extraction because it's so important for their uh, economic miracle. Iron ore, coal, oil, um, it's a very important. And then uh, in exchange for that, they do a lot of construction projects, which is also in their benefit because they can export labor teams and also they can export their steel, their cement, their whatever, have their cement factories in Africa. And it does have a very, has had a very positive knock-on effect in Africa in helping the development of some countries. It's also had a negative effect uh, in, in, because it's brought um, some bad practices, a lot of polluting industries as well. Um, and also the labor teams have a tendency to, to irritate the locals who want, want, want the jobs instead of the Chinese. Um, so, uh, and, and if you look at investment patterns, U.S. investment is much, obviously, much lower in Africa than that of the Chinese. Um, but that said, uh, even starting in the Bush administration, uh, George W. Bush, there was actually a relatively good dialogue between the Americans and the Chinese, with the Americans trying to convince the Chinese to, that if you take a more sustainable model of development, and investment, that's actually going to be better for your company in the long run because you don't have situations like you had in Zambia, for example, where you had these big anti-Chinese riots. And that's not such a good idea no matter where you're from. And the Chinese actually began, because of that, to modify some of their investment practices. So it's not pure competition. You just moved back here from China mm -hmm. for several years there while you were writing the book. Yeah. Um, knowing that this was going to get published in the fall, did you worry at all about publishing it while you were still living there? And can you foresee it being translated and shared with, with China? Uh, so uh, in terms of, like, let's say, if, if we had still been living in, in China and it was published, I, I wouldn't be worried. Um, uh, in terms of a Chinese version, actually, I'm talking with a Chinese publishing house about it, but it's a really interesting exercise. <laughs> In, in, because at, at, at actually at one point they basically, every time I use the word Tiananmen, it has to be taken out of the book. And so the, you know, the Tiananmen whatever incident, it's just the space incident. And, and so that, I, for me, mostly understanding the censorship is sort of a, it's just an interesting exercise because I don't think it's ever going to be published on the mainland. Um, uh, but that said, I, I, I would love it to be. But like many other books about China, um, it's just not going to happen for the time being, which actually gets to another issue about, you know, we have a, this idea of China as this unstoppable power, but, but countries that, that kind of cannot grapple with their history do have a tendency of flaming out. Hopefully they don't flame out and take all of us down with them, but, but the Chinese, in order to become the nation they really want to become, need to confront a lot of their history, and that is going to be, a, it seems to be a difficult process. Right now they're not in the, the government is not in the mood to allow that at all. So I'm not very optimistic that the book's ever going to make it in China. I, luxuries, uh, they come hand in hand with economic freedom. Right. Uh, where are the new Chinese princelings spending their money? I'm interested in specifically two. One, play toys, and two, out of country investments. Also, where is the Chinese government steering these princelings on both of those? So um, a lot of the princelings are spending their money in Los Angeles and in Vancouver. Uh, some in Seattle if, when you get to really high-end housing. Um, and then um, the, the new trend is uh, sort of high-end uh, uh, getaways, like safaris, um, af uh, adventures in Alaska. The Chinese like to travel in the North Pole. Um, they like to use NetJet a lot. Um, and so those are areas where rich Chinese are spending their money. Um, uh, play toys, I don't know so much about. Um, Lego is big in China, I can tell you that. Uh, oh, so yachts, yes. Um, the, 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 chi the Chinese um, uh, are involved in and actually looking to buy some of the, the premier yacht companies in the world. 
Um, and so that's, and also in terms of private planes as well. So that's, that's something that is, that, that, that the rich Chinese have the money to spend. Um, uh, and then, and then also, like I said, prime real estate, a lot of townhouses in the East sixties, um, in, in addition to the Hong Kong, uh, in addition, of course, Hong Kong, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, the West coast as well. And then some in London, but not so much. That's mostly a middle Eastern phenomenon. Hi. Um, I think the Obama administration uh, has almost invited a step-up great power uh, competition. So the Russians obviously have taken advantage of that, and uh, they've made great inruns in Crimea. They're pushing for you know all the way through Syria for a naval base and so on, and it looks like they're really uh, successful at it. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, um, having read uh, Kissinger's on China, um, his thought was that. Uh, they're really not doing that kind of thing unless you um, threaten their borders, and then they get aggressive about it. But there, there has been activity building islands in the South China Sea, right. challenging the Philippines for territory, yeah. uh, building aircraft carriers, and uh, building a military with some pretty nice jets, I guess. Right. Yeah. So my question is, what do you think their intentions are, and where do they want to go with that? So I think the Chinese ultimate intention in Asia is for them to be the preeminent power in Asia. Um, as Xi Jinping has said just a, about a year and a half ago, Asia should be run by Asia, by Asians. And I think what he meant was Asian should, Asia should be run by the Chinese. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really include Japan on, on, on his like duopoly. Um, and, and so the South China Sea episode, one, they actually believe it's their sea. Um, and the second is that they think that by making those islands, they will be able to push the United States Navy which has a tendency to get very close to China's coast because we're interested in their military bases as far away from China's coast as possible. And the third is that if you look at China, it's sort of hemmed in by the Japan, there's the Philippines, and the South China Sea is really their only kind of waterway that takes them out to the Blue Navy beyond. And they need to get, for example, their nuclear armed submarines out somehow uh, through the trenches of the Pacific so that they can maintain in the wacky world of nuclear uh, deterrence, uh, a first or second strike capability against us. And so pushing out from the South China Sea is clearly, but, but the, mo the broadest goal is that they ultimately, not tomorrow, not Thursday and whatever, but they ultimately want to replace the United States there um, as, the, as the resident power of Asia. And, they, and they've wanted that even before 1949. You had Chinese strate strategists and theorists in the late Qing, the early Republican era, who basically said, you know, Asia should be ours. Um, and, you know, they're the biggest dog there. And they talk about a lot of their, they frame a lot of their strategy in terms of, in American terms, they talk about a Monroe Doctrine for Asia, for example. So, so this, is, this is not, so, it's something that we haven't really taught them, but they can use our words back at us. When, when we say, you know, why are you building those islands? They're like, well, look how you dealt with Cuba. You know, that, so... You can understand, they have a certain amount of logic to them as well. With the one-child policy and the preference for males over females, yeah. uh, and the disparity in China between uh, the population of males compared to females, right. yeah. how do you see that playing out mm -hmm. in their culture and, and how is it affecting their society and, and many other things? That's a, that's a great question. You have a lot of provinces more rural. It's not so much a city phenomenon but you have a lot of problem, provinces where you have um, gender uh, imbalances of like 137 boys to 100 girls. And that, and you, uh, demograph demographers estimate there are about 40 to 50 mi million unmarriageable uh, Chinese guys. And unmarriageable men tend to be a little bit more um, troublesome than, than married, married men. Uh, and so you do have the, the knock-on effects of crime issues. You have a lot of wife stealing from Burma, Laos, and North Korea, um, especially because those places are a lot poorer, and Mongolia too, because those places are a lot poorer than China, so the, the networks can, can traffic the women. Um, so there's, there's, there, there are these issues, and, and partly because of that, the one-child policy was rolled back. It's now a two-child policy, and there's a lot of push of, to, against female infanticide. Uh, or just, it's, 
not so much infanticide as sex-selected abortions. And it's illegal, technically, in China to do a sonogram and tell the parents uh, of the expected baby uh, uh, what, the, what the gender is. But it happens because, you know, money talks. And then abortions happen in a, on a sex-selected basis, which, you know, uh, is the same as infanticide in the end, uh, you know, in terms of its result and effect on the population. So, well, so it's a difficult issue. It's one of the many challenges China faces. How do you see the future of the, the firewall? Um, particularly, you're talking about how uh, U.S. companies are being, Western companies are being pushed out. Are companies like Bing going to go away? Or are they just going to use Baidu? Or? Right. So that's a, that's a great question. Um, so in, initially, when, when the internet arose, everyone thought it was going to set China free, right? And then um, we then understood that actually the Public Security Bureau was very good at using the internet because they could use it actually to monitor what Chinese thought and what they wrote to each other. And they could use it as a way to crack down more efficiently. And then there was the, the, this rise of the firewall in terms of blocking sites. And then, of course, there's parallel to that a rise of the use of virtual private networks so people can jump over the firewall. And then, of course, there's rise of techniques to block the virtual uh, uh, private networks. And so it's always this kind of whack-a-mole game. That said, the Chinese internet, in the internet and using WeChat and a variety of other social media tools, if you're a, a young, switched-on person, you can get access to anything that's going on in the world if you just spend a little time trying to find it. Um, that said, the percentage of people who are young switched on in China is not incredibly huge. So pretty much anyone in Shanghai can, can do it and probably does it, knows how to do it if they need to. But Shanghai is not China. It's just a, it's a big city in China, but it's not all of China. And so for the, and, and the party's view is for the people who want to spend the effort to jump the firewall, we're not going to worry about them so much as long as they don't organize against us. But as long as we can keep a significant portion of our society generally in the dark and control the message to them, we're good. Uh, and so I think the firewall's future from that perspective is good. Um, but if you're entrepreneurial and you want to jump outside it, you can break it. But that's a tiny percentage of the country from the party's perspective. So like a vaccine is what you're saying? The firewall is like a vaccine, you keep a certain number of people. Yeah, exactly. Right. To keep, yeah, exactly. So that the disease doesn't spread too far. Perfect, perfect metaphor. I'm very grateful that you've written this book about such an important topic. And I'm, just, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that it's uncertain whether it will be uh, published in China. I'm wondering, um, given that uncertainty, if you're aware of any authors or journalists or scholars in uh, China that are focusing on the same issue that you are, the importance of this uh, U.S.-China relationship, and particularly with the longitudinal focus that you've had in this book. You know, there, there are, um, and there are a lot. And one of the great things was that we were living in China while I was writing this book. And so I had the, 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 the great pleasure uh, of getting so much inspiration from Chinese historians. And when they break out of the kind of Marxist straitjacket, uh, they're so good. Um, and sadly, um, because of the tightening in China, uh, many of them can't publish their best work now. And in many cases, I was the beneficiary of that because they shared their sources with me, archival and otherwise, and allowed me to use them. Um, and in many cases, they, I can't credit them even though I stole it, you know, shamelessly in a way. But I can't credit them because that would get them in trouble. Um, but there's a lot of people who look at the U.S.-China relationship, a lot of people who want to write about it. Um, and then there are things that are published in like these very obscure magazines um, that sort of, you know, kind of go under the, under the uh, get, get, get under the radar. radar. But, but, but the Chinese historians, when they're good, they're extraordinarily good. So, you know, yes. I'm double dipping. If you go a few miles east from here, you come to Redmond, which is the headquarters of, of Microsoft. Right. And if you watch Netflix there, you'll notice that the top movies there are all Mumbai movies, or Bollywood movies. Right. And you haven't said anything about India and, and China. Mm -hmm. um, a, 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 sorry, is that? They, they yeah. have the second biggest population. Right. So um, India and China have a massively competitive relationship. 
even though they have a lot of shared interests. Um, and, and it's not going to get better between those two um, countries. In the United States, one of the sort of successes of the Obama administration is that our relationship with India is, is even better than it was under George W. Bush, and he improved it um, from what it was under, under um, the Clinton. Um, and uh, India, uh, as a democracy uh, and an Asian power, uh, is very interested in increasing its influence in Asia. And so you have situations now like the Vietnamese have, brought, have bought very technically advanced kilo-class submarines from the Russians. But the Russians, because they don't want, they, they're happy to sell Vietnamese the kit, but they don't want to actually train the Vietnamese because then the Chinese would be too mad at them. So the Indians are coming around and are going to train the Vietnamese on how to use the submarines because the Indians have been buying, of course, Russian military equipment for decades. And so that's part of the, this kind of dance between the Asian powers. India has a very increasingly close relationship with Japan, and it's done part of their strategic interest in trying to, in, in some ways, box in China. Um, and the Indians have been cracking down on Chinese investment in India, uh, specifically Huawei, which is a very big uh, Chinese telecoms com com uh, company, uh, because of Indians' concerns that Huawei are, are using back doors in, into India's um, telephone system in order to be able to monitor uh, telephone traffic in India. So that, the tension between these two countries, which fought a war in the early 60s, mind you, um, just right about, about the time we were having our Cuban Missile Crisis, um, is going to rise, I think. And actually, my, my feeling, if there actually is going to be the potential of a war in Asia, it will not be between the United States and China, but China might, might fight a war with India because it's not an American treaty ally. Uh, and, and the Chinese have done a lot on the Tibetan border in terms of making it into effectively a this kind of a plateau-like aircraft carrier. And on the Indian side, the Indians have not done anything to strengthen their border, and so the Chinese have a lot of power up there. And if there's fighting, that, that's what I worry about, other than North Korea, which is the, the black swan incident that we'll see in Asia sometime. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, it was fascinating to hear you talk about how the Chinese intellectual property and you know, building electric cars and the best windshields. For quite some time, entrepreneurs are very uneasy about taking their IP to China, and right. particularly investors. Yeah. As, as China begins to develop its own IP, how yeah. do you see their respect for IP internationally changing, how, how that's going to play out? Yeah, I, I think that um, foreign pressure is of limited utility from a certain perspective unless you have a lot of leverage. And so, for example, when Charlene Barshevsky was a, a U.S. trade negotiator with China, uh, she would basically say, well, if you don't shut, begin to shut down your DVD factories, which churn out Hollywood movies, we're going to cut trade. And at, that, at the time, um, a huge percentage of Chinese GDP was relying on foreign trade, and a huge percentage of China's foreign trade was with the United States. Now, only 21% of China's GDP is reliant on foreign trade, and every five years that goes down five percentage points. It's getting smaller. It's still big, but it's getting smaller. But our leverage on IPR issues on China is not zero, but it's not what it used to be. And so what's going to happen is that internally that leverage has to, has to begin, that pressure has to start, because you can't innovate in a society where you got a great idea and the dude around the corner will steal it and start making it. And so that's, that's ultimately whether you know, China will live and die. One of the issues that China is going to live and die on is that battle between the innovators in China and the people that want to steal the innovator's idea and creating some type of a predictable legal system that can defend the rights of the innovators. You know, not a legal system where the judge is going to you know, roll over for a certain amount of payoff or whether you know, you're not considered a Communist Party faithful guy even though you're brilliant and the other person is. They're gonna, I mean, these type of issues, they, they need to deal with them. Um, that said, there are improvements. Um, and as Chinese take more Chinese to court, these things are slowly getting worked out. Um, and China's not yet at the point of innovation. I mean, I mean sorry, invention. That's, that, that's a big step. But they are definitely at the point of innovation. You look at WeChat, for example. Um, which is a Chinese, it's like WhatsApp. It's basically like WhatsApp, a, a bank, an online banking platform, a dating website, news site, all wrapped into one. It's much better than Facebook Messenger by far. In fact, it's a lot better than Facebook. 
Um, and it's, but it's also Facebook and a bank. Um, it has just, a, and, and, and it, that, it doesn't, it, it, there, were, there was no invention that went into that. They just took a lot of technologies from around the world and put it into one app, and it's, and it's remarkably good. Um, so, yeah. um, you mentioned Kissinger earlier, and I've always been kind of confused why Kissinger seems to be liked so much by the Chinese, since obviously he's always been promoting U.S. interests. Um, could you give a little background on that? Yeah, so... Um, he, he, he was, I mean, the Chinese like him because he was there at the beginning. And um, when he was there at the beginning, he also gave the Chinese a lot. Um, in fact, as things have become de declassified, we've learned that he's actually given the Chinese a lot more than he said he gave the Chinese. So um, when we first began talking to China in the 70s, and Kissinger went on a secret trip and then went publicly, uh, in, in, in dialogue that is now declassified, he basically told the Chinese, look, you're going to get Taiwan back. Just be patient. And that the only reason why we're allies with Japan is we don't want them to become a military force again. We're going to keep them quiet. Uh, ultimately, we're going to leave South Korea, so don't worry. You'll be able to you know, resume your dominance of the Korean Peninsula like you did during the Qing Dynasty. And so he appealed to their sense of importance. And... One could say, well, that's, that wasn't very nice, or that was sneaky, because, I mean, Kissinger was playing to take down the Russians, right? He's a Europeanist, and he was trying to use China to take down the Russians. But in so doing, and in kind of appealing to China's, you know, vanity, if you will, he set expectations uh, for the Chinese that we never could match. Taiwan is not part of China yet. Uh, we haven't left South Korea. Uh, and so a lot of the promises he made, to the China, and, and, and we actually have a very strong relationship with Japan because we actually you know, share a lot of values with the Japanese, not simply because we want to keep them from being militarists again. And so the things he did and the way he did them appealed to the Chinese vanity, and I think they've always liked him for that. Also, in 89, during the, after the Tiananmen Square crackdown, he was a hugely influential voice in the halls of power in Washington, for keeping the relationship on an even keel, despite the fact that the Chinese had, you know, killed a lot of their own people, and so they they remember that for him, uh, for, you know, remember him for that as well. And so, 93 years old, he was there just the last couple of days, meeting with Xi Jinping, as the Chinese kind of worry about how to deal with Donald Donald Trump. So um, I don't think they have huge ambitions in the Mideast other than to ensure they get as much oil as they need. So um, they're a little bit worried about Iran because they went, went in on the Iran sanctions and now that the sanctions are lifted, hopefully for a while, but you never know, um, uh, the Chinese are getting cut out, and a lot of European companies are coming in and taking the place of the Chinese, and the Chinese are not happy about that. The Chinese also have a very close relations with the Saudis. They sold the Saudis their first inter 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 intercontinental ballistic missile, actually. Um, and the Chinese, and, and, and so th for them, the Middle East, their perspective of the Middle East is not so much geopolitics, it's more maintaining secure oil supplies. Um, and, and, and that's, that's their view of it. Now, you see them buddy-buddy with the Russians on a lot of UN uh, resolutions and, and also kind of backing the Russians in, in Syria. But, and, and, and they're involved in Syria to the extent that they're selling an enormous amount of weapons to, to, the, to Assad's army. But that's, that's a business, from, from their perspective, that's a business proposition and they're happy to benefit from that. But I don't see them having great geopolitical political designs on the, on the region, but more that they want to ensure oil. For, uh, Iraq is another example. They're very, very big in Iraq oil. Uh, a lot of investments in Iraq oil. So people say you know, the United States fought the war, for, war in Iraq for oil, but actually the United States fought the war in Iraq for whatever reasons it fought the war, but actually the, chi the Chinese got the oil. So <laughs> that's how history works. <laughs> I was just going to mention, sorry, excuse me. We have oh. time for just one more, one more oh. question. Oh, it's just one more one question. More. You're the last one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I can read Chinese, uh, so because my first language is Chinese. Also, I read some uh, opinion on Chinese website, uh, for example, Weibo or something. They said, okay, 
in uh, 50 years or, or 100 years, the Muslim may take uh, Europe. And then in the same time frame, maybe uh, African American and then also immigrants from Mexico or whatever will take the United States. So don't worry, we China will become the number one automatically. How do you explain this opinion? <laughs> you know, um, there's a lot of kind of wacky stuff in all sorts of languages um, on, on, on Weibo and on a variety of other so social media platforms. Um, that said, um, there's, a, there's an element, a very strong element in China of, of, of nationalism and of, of kind of wanting to be the greatest country in the world. And the Chinese uh, believe that at a certain point that they were, and they also believe that in the future they, they should be. And um, I guess that's not really such a bad thing. It does drive one to, to higher heights. And so from that perspective, um, it, something sort of, I recall something that Brzezinski, the former national security advisor under Carter said when he would go to China, he said he was really, really impressed by, by the Chinese and he kind of wished that we could bring some of their kind of huge ambition to this country as well and maybe, maybe that feeds into it somehow, um, I don't know. Um, but the Chinese also have their own problems too, we should not forget that. Again, so thank you very much for having me, I really appreciate it. <laughs>